All right. So um, it says here we cannot repent of this longing to be successful, but we can repent of seeking after it in the wrong way. Look at point number two. There is so much confusion, pain, disillusionment related to what a great and successful life is all about. We need a biblical definition of success. And can I say this? Um, I was young and now I'm old. <laughs> but you know what? In my own heart, I still feel like I'm a young person. I mean, I know I don't look like it, but I feel like I just graduated from high school not too long ago. I mean, I haven't changed the way I think and feel on the inside. But can I say this now that I'm a dad and I have four uh, kids, all who love the Lord, all who serve God. They're all involved with us here in the house of prayer from 21 up to 28. <laughs> They're all involved in this house of, of, uh, house of prayer. And to me as a dad and as a father of my wife that we've been married 33 years is that we love each other as husband and wife and that we have four kids who love us, still want to hang around with us. Did you know that's a miracle when your kids want to hang out with you? You know, it's like, where are you guys going? Oh, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay at home. We're going to hang out with you guys. What are you all doing? Can we tag along with you? It's like, what's wrong with you? That's, that's a real blessing when that takes place. Now, you may not have that kind of family, you know, and that's okay because, you know, God can give you that kind of family. I didn't have that kind of family when I grew up. I had loving parents, but I didn't have that kind of family network, you know, as a young per before you know, before I was married. But God can give you that kind of family as you as you get married, as you grow. That can be the new uh, legacy that you set for yourself as a couple, as a young married couple. And uh, as you begin to have kids and that kind of thing, and as you grow in the Lord, how many want to be to me? That is success. Man, that is success. If I, if I can experience that, all this other stuff doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you know, whatever. All that other stuff doesn't matter. And so I, I feel so fortunate and so blessed to be able to, to say that to all of you tonight. And so we need a biblical definition of what, of what success is. And our humanistic culture, our humanistic culture defines success in terms of receiving recognition from people. I mean, he's ever experienced that. People want to be recognized. You know, they want, you, they want you to bow down to them. They define it that as being successful or being a person of influence. That You have a lot of power and a lot of authority, that you're the manager, that you're the top dog, that you run the place. That's just because you do doesn't make you a success, you know. And uh, it's funny, we... You know, we cause a scene everywhere we go. We go to Sears to buy a dryer. We cause a scene. Um, you know, we're going to get the cheapest price that we can get from the sales guy. And uh, if something isn't correct and just, we're going to hammer him over it, you know, and tell him, listen, how can you sell this dent dryer for the same price that you're selling this new one over here in the box? Uh, that doesn't seem right. You know, we talked a sales guy into giving us a better deal until his manager has to sign off on it, and then he says no. And, uh, of course, Pam says, where is that manager? Well, he's, he's busy right now. Well, get him down here right now. I want to talk to him. <laughs> uh, I mean, how many know that the fear of the Lord, I mean, all the other salespeople, they ran. <laughs> it was funny. There was about eight um, hungry sales guys standing around trying to sell dryers, and they all said, well, I think I'm busy. I'm going to go back here now. <laughs> we'll see you all later, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but, it's, but it's just funny how that is. How did we get off on that? What was the point? What? Getting a good deal. Yeah, okay, all right. That's good. Oh, position of influence. And I said to this young sales guy, because how many know the customer is always right? You got to treat your customers right. Listen, this is a business uh, meeting tonight, okay? You, if, you're, if you're working somewhere and you've and you're got customers that come into your place or if you've got people, you got to treat them right. You got to talk to them right. You can't be, you know, demeaning, well, we don't do those kind of things here. And, you know, and, and it got to a point in the conversation where Pam says, 
well, what do you think is right? As she's talking to the operations manager of the store. That's kind of scary. Well, I'm not going to, you know, you said you didn't really want, you know, whatever thrown in because, what, you know, whatever. And, and, he, and she said, well, what do you think is right? And he kind of stopped for a minute because he wasn't making the right decision as the top dog in that organization in that place that evening. And I, I remember saying to the young kid who was, who did the right thing, but didn't have the authority to do it, and, and he got next. I said, listen, if you stay with a company like this, you will go far having the, the kind of attitude that you have, that the customer is right, and you try to please the customer, and you try to make things right. That's the right thing to do, okay? And we told, we told the operations manager, now, he's not going to get in trouble over this now, is he? No, right, <laughs> you know, because he better not because we'll be back. <laughs> well, I mean, don't you think we should be doing those kind of things as, as Christians? Come on. Yeah, amen. Yes, just, okay. Number three, God invites us to greatness without regard to our outward achievements or the size of our ministry impact. It is based on the development of our heart. In love, meekness, and revelation. Did you know that many of us may not have a huge ministry or position where God puts you? But you know what, what the most important thing is that we do is that we remain faithful. Do you know what the greatest ability that you can have in life is that you are a faithful person? That you are a person of your word? That what you say what you sign up to do, that you're going to do it to the best of your ability. You know, one of the greatest abilities that you can have, anybody know what it is? Starts with a D. Well, that's good too. No. Dependability. (laughs) One of the greatest abilities you can have is dependability. There's nothing like a, a bus that is late. You ever had to wait for the bus and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and it's not there? One of the greatest assets that you can have in life is that whatever you say, you are a person of your word. You men, listen, your word is your bond. Ed Cole, you said, I remember Ed Cole, he used to have a men's ministry. He started men's ministry years ago. Your word is your bond. It's, it says in the word of God that God honors his own word above his name. And I'm talking to mainly young adults here tonight. If I can get one thing through to all of us here, and that is this truth. And I learned this at a young age. I learned it the hard way because I couldn't afford to make any mistakes when I was hired as a 20 one-year-old, I think I was, 20-year-old young kid as the operations manager of a international shipping company with, with these huge ocean-going vessels coming in to the port of Houston, and they always would come in at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And I couldn't afford not to be there and show up because guess who was waiting for me when I got there? U.S. Customs, U.S. Immigration, U.S. Department of Agriculture, all these people. And then if it got closer to work time, 8 o'clock, you would have like 40, 60, 80 longshoremen just standing there, union longshoremen. You know how much they cost an hour? Do you know what would happen if I didn't show up and the boss called me at the house at 9 o'clock in the morning and said, where are you? I mean, that was the biggest sweat fear that I had in my life, that I was going to get that call and I wouldn't be there. I was petrified. I couldn't sleep at night. I'd look at the alarm clock. I had people calling me. I had an answering service calling me. I had two different alarm clocks. I had an electric one. I had a wind-up one. I absolutely, positively have to wake up. Let me say this to you. It was drilled into me as a young person, 20, 20, 21 year old, is one of the greatest abilities that you can have before God. It's not a big flashy ministry and all these things and anointing and all that. It's that you show up. Do you know you're going to get a raise and you're going to be promoted if you just show up? 
they're going to hire this guy. He shows up. And, I mean, it sounds kind of goofy, and it probably is, I guess, because I'm making a major point here. But the point that I'm trying to make is that, man, God calls you to things. And what he looks at really is your heart. How faithful is your heart to the things of God? Look at, the, look at David. King David was so faithful to the Lord with the little things of life. That's why God chose him. He said, David, you're, you're a man after my heart. You know, the, the, the account of David with Goliath, if you read the account, there are several things that happened in David's life where it shows how responsible he was. When he went out to slay the giant, he said to his friends and his brothers, he said, here, you guys watch the sheep. You take care of the sheep because I, I have to go do this, but I don't want to neglect this thing over here. David was a man after God's heart. David didn't look for the big and the mighty. He looked to be in that secret place before the Lord in worship and adoration of God. That, to him, that was the biggest thing that he could possibly do before the Lord, was just to be a worshiper of the Lord. And so God, God has given us these, these assignments, and he's given gifts to us. Um, number three says, God invites us to greatness without regard to our outward achievements or the size of our ministry impact. It is based on the development of our heart in love, in meekness, in revelation. We are to focus on being great in his sight rather than in the sight of men. It is based on our heart responses, not on natural giftings and resources. It, and it will not be fully manifest until the age to come. And so, how many know God has chosen the weak things of this world? It says in 1 Corinthians 1.27, God has chosen the weak things to confound the mighty. And so the way to be great in the kingdom of God is you become small. You become low, right, before the Lord. You become faithful in the mundane, simple things that seem so insignificant. Do these things even matter? Who cares about these little things? It is huge in the sight of God. And when you do it as unto the Lord, because you're not, you're not to do things as unto only men. You do serve men. If you have a job, you serve men. But you ultimately, you're to look at it from God's perspective. I am doing this job because God called me and I am here in this place right now because the Lord put me in this, in this place. He gave me this assignment. And I'm not going to complain and have a, a rotten attitude about what I'm doing. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to write those things out as unto the Lord. I'm going to do the best that I can do. I'm not going to be sloppy in my work. I've said before the old uh, example, you know, you work at Wendy's. You don't, people don't work at Wendy's, though. They work at Chick-fil-A. You know, and Chick-fil-A does a good job. When you put a pickle on a chicken sandwich, why do they put pickles on the chicken sandwich? How many like pickles on the chicken sandwich? How many don't like it? Most people don't want it on there. <laughs> I've seen it so many times. People get a Chick-fil-A sandwich and they go, ugh, pickle, you know, and, But how many know that when you put three pickles on a sandwich, you don't just throw them in the corner of the sandwich. You, you lay them out evenly. I mean, that's how you serve the Lord. And some preacher one time said, you do it in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. So corny. But doing it unto God, you know, Anyway, God gave each person an assignment that will lead to their greatness and eternal rewards. This is based on the, on the uh, capacities that he gave to each person mentally, physically, emotionally, and financially. Did you know everything you have, your life belongs to God? How many know that? Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live how does that go? 
I, I, I live it in, in Christ. I live for him. I serve the Lord. And so each one of us should get up every single day and say to ourselves, I am living for the Lord today. I am serving God. I am being, uh, I'm working for the state. You know, I work for a bank. I work, um, you know, I am a student at Florida State University. I am going to serve the Lord in this position and and in this place. I will not bring shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to, to, I will not bring shame to God. I'm going to serve him and be a, a living witness for the Lord every day. How many know that we're not just to walk through life with a, with a dull mindset? We're just kind of going on autopilot, just kind of, I'm not even thinking, I'm not even aware, I'm just kind of doing my work. That is not God's will for you. God's will for you is to be engaged in your work in your calling and doing it as unto the Lord with all of your heart. I mean, pray in the spirit if you have to, if you feel dull-minded. Pray in the Holy Spirit and get your heart engaged in what you're doing. Number five, the definition of a great and successful life is found in doing God's will and in hearing Jesus say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's, that's out of Matthew chapter 25. And I want, you, I want us all to look in Matthew chap, chapter 25, and I want to just read this parable real quick. This is called the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. And it starts in verse 14. And it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Everybody say, I got the goods. I have the goods. God has given goods to you. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each one according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Who's this talking about? Who went on a journey? It's the Lord, right? Jesus went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went And he traded with them and made another five talents. Likewise, he also had received two talents. He gained two more also. But when he who had received one talent went, it says he went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents (coughs) came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents. I've, I, I took what you gave me, God, and I invested it, and I put it to good use, and look, look at what's come out of this. God, this is awesome. Here you go, Lord. And he said, the Lord said to him, oh, um, uh, the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over just a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Also, he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done. Whether you had five, whether you had two, as long as you took those talents and you put them to good use before God, you used your talents for the purposes of the Lord. That's God's intention for all of us. It said we take our talents and we use them for the Lord. God, I wonder what this talent that you've given to me, I wonder what it will do. I tell you what, Lord, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to throw it out there. Sound effects. I'm going to throw it out there and just see what happens. Did you know God has called you to live a life of risk? Not, I'm not saying bad investments. Don't ever invest in bad deals, in, you know. In fact, don't try to invest your money in any get-rich-quick 20% return on your money, some offshore account somewhere, even if somebody says praise the Lord to you. Don't you dare give money to that kind of thing. How do you make money? How do you earn a good return on your money? You do it the old-fashioned way. 
Smith Barney. Sorry. <laughs> we earn it. You, you guys are too young for that. Never mind. That's an old commercial. But you invested in the kingdom of God. But just think if you take your life and your talents and you take them and you give them to God, you say, Lord, I wonder what this will do. You know what happens? Most of us think, well, I, I don't think I'm anything really special. I really can't do a whole lot. I'm just me. You know, 99.9% .9 of people are just me type people. But do you know that God can take just a little bit of your life if you are willing to take that one part and say, God, I'm going to just try it out. I'm just going to risk it just a little bit for you, God. I believe that you're saying this to me, Lord, and I'm going to take a step of faith, God, and I'm going to invest it in the kingdom of God. Oh, Lord, this is scary. I don't know about this. This is really, you know, but I'm going to do it. That's what God has called us to do. It's easy to sit back on the sideline behind, you know, where everything is safe and you're behind the, the, the guardrail thingy and just say, oh, I don't know. Maybe someday, maybe, maybe I'll try it someday. And you just sit there and you go year after year after year and you do nothing. Matthew 25, it says, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Lord, here is what is yours. That's what a lot of people do. Oh, I'm afraid. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to invest my talent. I'm afraid. God, what if I fail? What if I don't succeed in this thing? Let me say this to you. Do not walk in fear. Do not be afraid. Believe God's word to you. Ask the Lord to tell you and show you what you're supposed to do. You know, a lot of people never get to that point in their life. They never ask God because they're afraid that God might answer them. Lord, what am I supposed to do? My son, my daughter. Ah! <laughs> God is talking to me. Do you know God talks to you and me? Did you know that? He talks to us. He tells you things. Go this way. Call this person. Take a risk for me here. But why? Lord, wait, is that you, God? Lord, is that really you? <laughs> You'll never do anything for the Lord when you're the one talent person and you're sitting back waiting for some big vision to come and show up right in front of you. Anybody can serve God if that happens. Jesus walks in your room and says, son or daughter, I am Jesus, and I want you to do this. I mean, that's, you'd be a fool if you didn't obey God at that point in your life. Anybody can do that. But when you're in that place where you hear the voice of God, you ask the Lord. That's the first step. You ask God. And then you hear what God says, and then you act on it, even though you don't know how in the world this is going to happen. Anybody ever been there? I've been there too many times. <laughs> You have no idea how this thing's going to happen. But you have conviction in your heart. God said it. God said it. And I'm going to do it. And, Lord, I don't see anything, but I'm going to hold on to your word. And I'm going to stand in faith. And I'm going to believe because I know, God, you are faithful. That's, that's a good definition right there. And so point number six in the parable of the faithful stewards, Jesus called us to focus on three things, to walk in the grace, to be faithful, which means diligence, and good, which speaks about motives, and then to walk with a servant spirit, which is humility, in our life assignment, even when it is difficult and small. Underline that, difficult and small. First of all, po the point good Good points to the goals and motivations with which things are done. 
It refers to the sincere intentions to love God and people and to do God's will in each area of our life. God honors uh, uh, holy motivation and sincere motivation. Number two, faithful emphasizes the diligence in our work. It refers to the follow through of our intentions to do good. Everybody say follow through. This is a good follow through message tonight. Just to learn how to follow through on the things that you're supposed to do. Follow through in our intentions to do good in the face of pressure, difficulty, mundaneness. Everybody say mundaneness. Like this is really boring. Um, and to be considered faithful requires that we are consistent for years. Our best faithfulness is flawed, but his evaluation of it is human friendly as he edits our life by his grace. And so, okay, we're not always perfect, okay? You're going to make mistakes. But our aim and our goal should be that we're going to be faithful. God, I'm going to serve you faithfully. I'm going to do the assignment that you called me to do, Lord. For seven years, the Lord told us seven year, 12 years ago, establish a house of prayer. Didn't know what it meant. Moved to Tallahassee. Spent five years uh, in ministry, pastoring a church, trying to figure out exactly how does this thing look? What does it look like? And then the Lord brought clarity five years into it. Can you imagine how, how much preaching five years is as a pastor? Do you know my garage? I have boxes full of tapes of messages that's 52 messages a year. You don't take a vacation when you're a pastor. You know, I mean, you do, but I mean, you don't just close the door. You know, you got to have somebody there. 52 messages, and you have midweek service, you know, whatever that adds up to. Times five years. That's a lot of tapes. I hate to say I've not gone back and listened to one of them. <laughs> That's pretty bad. But you know what the Lord said? Be faithful to me. Do this. Just serve faithfully. Just do what I've called you to do. Okay, God, I'm going to be faithful. And then God, five years into it, he, he brought a more revelation to the picture. Okay, now go this way. This is what I meant by what I said five years ago. Do you know time means nothing to God? He's plenty of time. He, he's time, time and eternity. He's timeless. You know, you get people that shake their fists at God and say, you know, like Voltaire, you've heard that saying before. He said, in a hundred years, the Bible will be a forgotten book. And God just yawns at that. And he just waits a hundred years. And the guy is in his grave. And his house is made the headquarters for the Geneva Bible Society. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. It says he laughs. He who sits in the heavens, he laughs. That's why I crack so many jokes. Number seven, one stumbling block to a life of greatness is that the pathway to it is to be diligent and humble in, in the context to smallness with difficulty. That is the hardest thing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Five years preaching every week, serving the Lord faithfully, doing what God called me to do in, in that period of time for five years. You're willing to invest five years. In something. In smallness, with difficulty. We imagine that we would be faithful and humble if God gave us a big and easy thing to do. And that's what I really thought was going to happen. I thought I was going to come into town, put a sign out, have 100 people there Sunday morning, have to find a new building right away. We're going to have to find bigger facilities. We're going to have to hire people, you know, to take care of everything. And that's what I thought. I mean, you know, God has a way of training you, putting you through school. It's called Bush University. Moses went to Bush University. He was going to be the deliverer of Egypt and tried to tell somebody that, ended up killing the guy, and he fled into the wilderness and was there 40 years and just sat by a well, it says in the book of Exodus. He sat by a well. What do, you th what do you think Moses thought about for 40 years? 
And then one day God appeared to him in a burning bush. And at that point, when God said, Moses, I've called you, I'm sending you back to Egypt. What did what did Moses say? Do you remember? He had all kinds of excuses. Forty years earlier, he knew exactly what he was going to do. He was the anointed of God, the called of God. Now it's like, I don't have any idea how to do one thing. I can't even talk right. I stutter. I, you know, I don't know how to do nothing. And the Lord said, good. Now I have you where I want you. <laughs> now you're dependent upon me. Here, take the staff and go back to Egypt and I'll be with you. Amen. How many want to go to Bush University? How many of you are in Bush University right now? Anybody? <laughs> Lord, what's going on in my life? <laughs> Number eight, we must continually realign ourselves to greatness and success on God's term, terms as defined by Jesus. He calls us to greatness that is based on a life focused on doing good, being faithful, and living with a servant spirit in context to smallness and difficulty. <clears throat> God, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to do good. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to do this unto you, even in the smallness, even before I see the crowds. I don't care about the crowds anymore, Lord. I'm going to serve you with all of my heart and just be faithful unto God. Lord, if it's just me sitting here, I'm going to be faithful. Sometimes it is. <laughs> Literally in the house of prayer, you know you got to be able to endure that. You have to. I'm saying that because sometimes the, the hour is so ungodly. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, opening up at 6 in the morning on, on some days. It's, it's, a, it's early. Well, you, you are made that way. No, I'm not. I, li I love to sleep, <laughs> especially at that time of day. But I whip my flesh into subjection. I get the coffee pot going. I pour it in. Are you awake yet? I'm awake. I'll pray. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what am I going to pray? I don't know. I'm just going to pray. God, help me. <laughs> Come, Lord. Show up. Do something here today. Oh, it's, it's really not that bad. It's fun, though. But anyway, but you serve the Lord in those small things, in those difficult times. Number nine, greatness is within the reach of all in the grace of God. Jesus is committed to our long-term greatness. He has a tailor-made plan for our eternal success. You've got to cooperate with that plan, every one of us. We've got to cooperate with the plan of God for our lives. We've got to find out what it is. And then be faithful to it day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. Faithful to God until he tells you something else to do. And then you become faithful to that thing. Man, my hat is off to those of you who faithfully serve and faithfully do what you've done for years. It's not easy. It's not easy to you know, work in the workplace for many, many years. I think of people that have put in 20, 25, 30 years in the same place. It's like, oh, my goodness, that's a long time. How do you do it? That's what it is. It's that faithful spirit. I'm determined. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be here. I'm going to do this thing. And I think that's what God, I don't think, that is what God is calling all of us to do. We live in an a time of, of lack of focus in the body of Christ and just flimsiness and, you know, just light, <coughs> light determination in our thinking and just kind of whatever, you know. And I believe God is calling us into this place of just being steady, steady as she goes. Everybody say steady as she goes. Steady as she goes. All right. In this parable, Matthew 25, Jesus corrected the idea that our work only matters if it impacts many people. Our assignment, our sphere of influence may be small in man's eyes, but it is important in God's 
eyes. What you do is very important to God. It's very, don't you ever complain. Don't you ever underestimate what you do serving the Lord. It is very, very, very important to the Lord. It moves him so much that he rewards us for it. Look at what it says here when it's talking about you've been faithful with a few things. Point number A, in the perfect will of God, most have a small assignment. That's not a penalty. God is not penalizing you because you have a small assignment or you think it's small. We must see the dignity of the small work that God entrusts to us. Almost everyone has a small assignment touching less than 10,000 people on a regular basis. <laughs> How many you touch 10,000 people? Well, some of you may. Some of you may work in a place that touches thousands of people. I believe that 99.9% .9 of the body of Christ has a small individual assignment. Corporately, as we work together in the body of Christ, we can make a big impact in our generation. How many know that all of us working together, what does it mean when... What is fellowship? There's a bunch of fellows in this same ship. We're all working together. We're all corporate. We're all doing it well, moving together. We're all moving as one unit. Not one of us individually, ourselves, is very mighty and powerful. But together in God, we can, we can do awesome things. We can move mountains. Amen? Works that way in prayer. It works that way in a house of prayer. Many things, there is... Uh, there is coming a great exchange from few things in this age to many things in the age to come. Our assignment in the millennium is based on the size of our heart, not the size of our individual ministry impact. And so when that day comes, God is going to look at you and say, were you faithful with the little that I gave to you? Yes, Lord, here it is. I was faithful, God. I served you. I served you diligently, Lord. I I sought your face. I was faithful unto you. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And so we look forward to the day of the great exchange. And it says, I will make you ruler. <coughs> this is <clears throat> an essential component to a life of success and greatness. Jesus set before his people eternal rewards. Do you know that that's not just a nice idea in the Bible? It just sounds kind of nice. You know, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to play harps. God's going to give us rewards. And, you know, did you know that that's really what's going to happen? God is going to reward you for, for your faithfulness unto him. We had uh, one of our staff members this week um, send all of us an email, and she just felt impressed by the Lord that God was saying something to us as a staff. And then what was he saying to us? Do you remember? Yeah. Well, tell, tell me. I just felt like the Lord was saying thank you for standing in intercession because when we pray, then God gets to do what he wants to do because he won't do our part. We have to actually pray so that he gets to release what he wants to do. And He, I just felt almost like thanking everybody for, for praying because... He felt so thankful and was just honoring us because of that. The Lord was thankful. Can you imagine God saying, thank you for praying. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for standing in that place and praying my heart over the issues that are important to me. That's what God was saying to Hannah. It was a prophetic word. She sent it to our staff, and it was like, wow. You never think of God thanking you for praying. It was just, it was profound. <clears throat> and so the Lord says, enter into the joy. The saints will have great joy ruling in partnership with Jesus. Jesus rewards us with the privilege of close partnership with him. Um, let's look down to uh, point number two, uh, Roman number two, the importance of having right expectations. People get discouraged if they have a wrong perspective on what they're supposed to be doing. They're told to pursue greatness in their life, and they often misinterpret it in terms of having large uh, or in, uh, large individual ministry impact. And so what happens is they, they, they encounter despair because of, of th what they're seeing in their, in their own life. The, you can apply this to any area of your life. 
whether it's in a mar marketplace or business or work, it's like you get discouraged because big things aren't happening. And God is, is wanting to say to you, you just be faithful. And you just continue doing what I've called you to do and just know that I'm going to come through for you and put your trust and your confidence in me. Number two, it says they get disillusioned and offended by the smallness of their ministry, again, concluding that they have been lied to. This pain can be avoided by knowing that God is pleased by our love and labor. Hope refers to our expectations. If our expectations are only focused on having ministry impact that is affirmed and recognized by others, then we are vulnerable to becoming heart sick with disappointment. Anybody who's called into full-time ministry, you're going to go through this test. I'll tell you right now, if you're not in full-time ministry yet and you're going in there, you're going to go through this test. You're going to experience that. You're going to experience a lack of people affirming you. You're going to experience smallness. It's going to be like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know it was going to be like this. And, 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 and just mark my, I mean, I mean I'm, not just, I'm not talking negative. I'm not trying to spread a negative report. I'm just telling you that's the reality of what happened because God will test your heart. He will test your resolve. Did God really call you? Did he really say this to you? He will, he will test you in that, and you have to endure. You have to endure. If you're going to come out on the other side, and be one of the giants that are written about later in life that people say, did you know what this guy did? It's amazing. Because they'll praise you 100 years later, but they won't praise you while you're in the middle of it. Isn't that funny how that is? They'll write about you later. Oh, wow, that was amazing. Where is he, <laughs> you know? Uh, but uh, it's, so, it's so important. Get yourself ready. Get ready for it. I don't, I don't care what it is God has called you into. Any big step of faith, you're going to be tested in it. You're going to face when nobody's there and you're there by yourself and your thoughts come to you. And even the accuser of the brethren comes to you. Hey, now what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? And then you start, well, that was all your idea. Why did we do that? I didn't think that was a good idea anyway. You said that was, you know, and you get into this whole thing. No, God said it. I don't, see all, I don't see all the things coming together right now. I don't feel a thing. I don't feel anointed at all. <laughs> but I know I'm called. I know God said it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay faithful. And I can't tell you why certain things aren't happening the way I thought they should have, but I'm just going to stay faithful and pray and serve the Lord and praise God. Amen? Isn't that the story of Job? You know, I know this one thing. I know my Redeemer lives. I don't know about all this other stuff, but I know he lives, and I know that I will see him again, and I'm going to serve God, and I'm not going to allow my mouth to say things that would betray what I believe God has called me to do. I'm not going to let it come out of my mouth. Amen? And so... Number two, it says they get disillusioned and offended by the smallness of their ministry, concluding that they have been lied to. Number three, hope refers to our expectations. Number four, we must live in agreement with God's definition of success. When we let our expectations be formed by what Scripture says, we can live with hope, our expectations that are, that are not, or expectations that are not Deferred, unfulfilled expectations call people to give up in disillusionment with a sense of futility and rejection. This can be avoided by agreeing with the biblical ex expectations. Okay, a successful life, key areas to focus on. God is focused on the size of our heart responses, whereas we are usually focused on the size of our ministry impact. Again, our individual impact may not be large numerically, but we can be successful before God by growing deep in love being faithful and walking with a servant spirit. And so, number three, down towards the bottom of the page, says being faithful in our assignment, we commit to being faithful or diligent in our life assignment. This includes our preparation, skill, development, and work related to our life assignment. Our assignment involves 
diligently preparing ourselves. And I want to underline that, and I want, I, I want to encourage you to be diligent in your walk with God, in your life, in your calling. Apply some diligence. Get out of lazy mode. Get out of this idea that you are not called to do more, that you're just, you know, become diligent. Apply yourself. Pray. Get up earlier. Read the word. Um, exercise your body. That's what God is talking to me about right now. On a treadmill. <sighs> Push it up a notch. There's a voice inside that says, I don't know if, if it's me or the devil. <laughs> Put it on 4.0. <sighs> Put it on 4.2. Man, that's fast walking. Sweat a little bit. Do it for a minute. Now do it for another minute. Do it for a third minute. It's like, oh my gosh. We need to do that to ourselves. You know, we're talking about fasting. Yeah, we, we should fast for the conference. I want you to fast food. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just saying that to you. <laughs> Find something to fast. Forget the Internet and your tweeter, Twitter. <laughs> I'm going to fast my Twitter. I'm not going to go on Facebook. No, fast food. I want to... I want to hear your body screaming in pain. <laughs> ah, I'm dying. You know, yeah, you are dying. Don't eat anything. Fast. <laughs> Enough of this. I'm fasting blue M&Ms. You know, that's pathetic. <laughs> Put some pain in there somewhere. <laughs> Don't give me some of that mamby-pamby <laughs> stuff. Put some pressure on this thing. I want to I wanna see these people walking around for three days just, oh, I haven't eaten anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm not telling you to fast for three days, but you know what I mean? Put a little effort into it, will you? I mean, we fast like, I don't even know if we can affect a flea, you know? <laughs> Put some pain into it. <laughs> Fasting, yeah. Be faithful in your assignment. Note the bottom of the page, have a servant spirit. Develop humility towards God and people. Cultivate a servant spirit. Serve people. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? You know, we went out and met pastors this week. Uh, went to a couple of churches, met pastors. We're just here to connect with you, let you know we're in the community, we're praying. We have, you, know, you know about our house of prayer. You, we already knew them. How can we serve you? What can we pray for you about? What's going on in your church? We just felt like that was important. It was cool to hear people say, well, honestly, I mean, you can pray about this, this, and that. Well, sure, we're going to pray for you right now. I think they really appreciated that. You know, try serving people. I, I don't mean it just out of, this thing where you want something in return and you do it because you want to see what they're going to do back to you. No, just serve people, love people. You know, we need to, we are the family of God. We are the church of the living God. We should be out there serving each other. We should be uh, mowing the neighbor's lawn, <laughs> you know, when he's on vacation and gone or whatever. Can you imagine the shock? Oh, my gosh, what, what just happened? Of course, mow your lawn, too. <laughs> Don't forget your lawn. <laughs> but develop a servant spirit. Walk in kindness. Be generous. Be generous with your word, with your resources. Give somebody a gift card to Chick-fil-A <laughs> or whatever. Just be, be a blessing to somebody. You don't even have to say where it came from. You can just hide it in your Bible, you know. Put 20 bucks in there and then watch them, you know, from a distance and watch them. Went, Whoa, what happened? What is this? <laughs> it's fun to do that kind of stuff. Last page, doing God's will involves denying our own agenda. The God who orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus 
is orchestrating our right now. He also orchestrates our resurrection. So we learn to die to self, right? We die to self so we can serve others. That's what Philippians 2 is all about. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Live a life of service. Bear your cross and come after the Lord and be his disciple. I want to ask the worship team to come up. <clears throat> Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to conclude the service and just uh, our time together here tonight in just a couple of minutes. But Lord, we just thank you for this evening, God, and we just thank you for your word. God, and I pray that you will help us to be good and faithful servants unto you, Lord. God, help us to be diligent in serving you. Help us to know that whatever station of life you called us into, that, God, you're calling us to be the best that we can be, to serve in faithfulness. And, Lord, to do it unto you, God. And to have joy in our hearts, Lord, and not have a bad attitude, God. Lord, I just pray right now for every person here, God, that you would touch every heart. Lord, give us a new zeal for you, a new desire for you, Lord. And God, I pray for any person that's weary. Is anybody here that's just, you're just kind of weary? It's okay to be weary. You just need God to just strengthen you and just give you just new energy and a new resolve in your life and a new fire. And, uh, Lord, we just pray for them right now. God, there's several people that raise their hands up. God, I just ask you to touch them, Lord. I ask you to put a new fire in their hearts, Lord, a new zeal for you, God, a new joy. Lord, you're going to wake them up in the middle of the night, and they're just going to feel like, wow, I just feel, I feel so excited in the Lord. There's just new life on the inside of me. I don't know what's going on, but I'm excited all of a sudden. And I just see that there's new things going on. God is doing a new work in my life. I believe that's going to happen to several of you uh, in the middle of the night tomorrow. You're going to experience that. The joy of the Lord, the supernatural strength of God is going to come and touch you. The Lord is going to, he's going to bless you with his presence, with his strength. And he's going to do it because you've been faithful unto God. It will be a token of the reward that he's going to give unto you out of the pleasure of his heart. God just saying, thank you for being faithful where you are. You're going to, I believe God is going to do that in the middle of the night this evening. There will be that impartation into you. Don't be surprised if you just wake up all of a sudden full of energy instead of being half dead. <laughs> Experiencing the, oh, hallelujah. I just feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> you used to be wide awake. You might as well get your Bible out and get your little lamp out and start reading the word and praising the Lord and walking around the house. Don't wake anybody else up when you do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, we love you tonight. We bless you. God, you're a good God. You have good plans for us. And we're just excited to be serving you tonight, Lord. We bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Let's just worship the Lord for just a few moments before we go.
sake, I'll find it in the end. I'll find it in the end. If I try to save my life, I will lose it. If I lose my life for your sake, I'll find it in the end. For this is true.
we thank you for the joy of sweet surrender and the peace of pure abandonment. And God, tonight that you've just given us a glimpse of you in a, in a greater way, Lord. And that is our heart's cry. We want to know you. We want to see you, Lord. We want to love you. And we surrender all to you. God, we thank you for who you are. And we praise your holy name. And Lord, we ask you as we go from this house of prayer that our hearts would stay engaged and alive with who you are, Lord, and we would have an expectancy that would grow, that you do want to move in our lives, and God, that you want to move in this city, in this region, and Lord, that we can hear the sound of rain. God, that you want to make our hearts dreams from heaven that you would open our eyes and we would have God encounters even in the night hours Lord that you would come and you would invade our hearts and our rooms and God that you would speak to our hearts and your word will come alive and God we thank you we have that expectancy Lord God that success is in knowing you and obeying that you are faithful and you are looking for faithful ones in this hour. And we say, here we are, Lord. Use us. Let us be lovers of you in these end times. And we thank you, God, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. just feel like the Lord has been in this house tonight and in our lives. And we just encourage you, press into his presence. Just press in throughout this week and just take that time to get alone with the Lord and let him speak clearly to you, to each of our hearts as individuals. So I just want to encourage you guys. We're going to open up the house of prayer for fellowship now. IHOP opens at 6 a.m. on Monday morning and just, you know, press in. We bring, I just feel like the Lord, I, even tonight as, as at the end, even as we were worshiping, I remembered some times in the Jesus movement that there was such a sweet presence of the Lord and things began to happen. And I felt that feeling of just the Lord. He is up to something and we are entering into a time and season that it is gonna be some awesome, cool stuff that's happening and the lost is gonna come in. God's gonna use each of you guys. When you go on campus this week or next week, wherever, whenever teachers going back, professors going back to school, man, you expect God to just shake things up and use you. So let's fellowship. We're gonna put on some worship music and um, in, if you need any other prayer for anything, um, just come and see one of us. God bless you guys.